What's up, everybody? Thanks for listening to the WhatCast. Mike, we're going to get into some good old classic weirdness. Some weird shit. Weird wartime shit. Yeah. And this time, it's not fucking aliens. <laughs> for once. For <laughs> once, we've got weird wartime stories not involving aliens. So, Except for one, I'm going to tell one UFO story, but we got other stuff to talk about. Cooler stuff, maybe, prob- probably at least at least scarier. <laughs> yeah, well, this is going to be centered around a specific war, and that's uh, stories reported by U.S. soldiers who experienced strange things on many levels while serving in the war in Afghanistan. Now, when you first think of weird wartime stuff coming from Afghanistan, what's the first thing that pops into your head? I mean, after this, it's going to be fucking ghosts. <laughs> or, or well well maybe maybe not necessarily ghosts but yeah yeah ghosts i'm going to it's going to be ghosts but be, before that it probably would have been like gin or something right maybe aliens maybe heroin demons i don't know there's, ooh a demon specific to heroin there's got, it's got to be right there's got to be yeah it haunts the poppy fields and and when you're not looking it's like it's like he who walks among the rows or, or whatever is he who walks behind the row, whatever the children of the corn deity is, but it's, it's for poppies, <laughs> but it actually won't hurt anybody because it's loaded on heroin. Is too Oh amazing. yeah. It's so fucked up. Like if, if he ever gets sober though and, and has to get clean, like the world is fucked. We're all doomed guys. <laughs> so, you know, maybe, uh, Maybe keep maybe maybe heroin isn't all bad after all. You ever think about that? You ever think about the demons that that heroin may be saving the world from? The dope. We should count our blessings that heroin exists, guys. Or we'd be run over with heroin and crack rock demons just flooding our entire yeah. planet. But I I I want to I want to be clear here by me saying thank God for heroin. I'm not saying that any human should do heroin because that's not a good idea. What I'm saying is that it's a good thing it exists so that this demon doesn't wreak havoc on the universe. That's all I'm saying. If you're a human and if you're, if you are a demon specific to heroin, then I, I shoot up, fully recommend that you do heroin all of the time. But if you are human, that is not a demon that needs heroin to, to stay chill then don't ever do heroin ever. Yeah, guess how much of the time you should be doing heroin? It's zero. Yeah, it's zero of the times that you should be doing heroin. So, um, you know, this has been a public service announcement brought to you by Heroin Demons and the Whatcast. <laughs> well, one of the first things that comes to my mind is this, uh, this case of a, a giant. I'm not going to, I'm going to have you say the name because I've messed it up the last eight times I've said it. <laughs> The, are you referring specifically to the giant of Kandahar? Yeah, and we okay. when we decided to cover this, you have some stuff to cover, but when I looked into this, uh, the, the first thing that comes up in my mind, because it was on Coast to Coast, uh, and but the first thing that comes up on the internet is giants. There's soldiers encountering giants in Afghanistan, but uh, I, I, like I've said before, I never got to listen to Coast to Coast. I don't know, I, I guess... This attack took place in 2002, and I say attack because that's what's reported. And I, yeah, pretty th- much. Yeah. So uh, in this case, I guess there was a, a group of soldiers that went missing, and they sent a team to go look for them, and uh, they found, I guess, your typical alien scene, you know, predator, just a little bit of bunch of blood, equipment everywhere, uh, but nobody alive in sight, and they said that they were suddenly attacked by a giant very similarly described like the giant skeletons we talked about being 13 feet tall, six fingers, red hair, and two rows of teeth. Weren't the teeth on, on this one sharpened? 
I I don't know. I read that they were just a huge, like a normal huge grin. I read that they were sharp. Uh, oh God, a huge grin. Yeah. Like what is this fucking Attack on Titan? <laughs> oh God, my kids wanted to watch that, and we this is a while ago, and we we said sure, let's put it on, let's see what it is. That shit's fucking horrifying. It's awesome, dude. It's so fucking. I I honestly, I've only gotten like, I don't know. I think I watched maybe the first ten episodes. But like the first couple episodes I was watching, I'm like, this is this is fucking terrifying. Ab- this is so goddamn scary. Yeah, I when I first put it on, I was like moved to, by how disturbing and frightening it was. I was like, Jesus, fucking, what the fuck is this? But uh, yeah, definitely uh, a, a cool representation of giants were pissed. But uh, apparently, the one these soldiers ran up on was pissed because it instantly killed a soldier with a fucking spear. Yeah, it just comes flying out of the cave, just tosses a spear without even thinking like a badass and impales a dude. I bet he then ran by and tried to pull it out. Right. To fight with it, because he's fucking a ninja warrior. (laughs) Stories report that uh, the thing only went down after a full 30 seconds of automatic fire being laid down on this thing. And they say that... The superior on scene called it in, and a helicopter came and picked it up, and it was never seen again. Now, did you ever listen to the coast-to-coast story? Is this someone who is supposedly there, or is this somebody making a report, taking a report? I have not heard the original story on Coast to Coast. Um, my Where I've heard this story is everywhere on the Internet. Like, to me, this, this story, I... F- I, I didn't even realize was originally on uh, Coast to Coast because every time I hear it, it's on like one of those spooky narration channels or like if you're researching giants on the internet, it'll it'll pop up a lot. Yeah. Um. So so it's it's like one of those things that I I've seen like a thousand times not literally but i've seen so many times on the internet now that it just kind of to me it seemed like probably it's it's a hoax because it's it's one of those things i had never come across outside of the internet so it just seemed like it was like a a creepypasta sort of thing like the i don't know like all that shit you see on the the reddit channels and and the scary story narration channels and shit. I I figured it was something like that and uh, didn't really put too much. Like, I I thought it was a cool story and kind of left it at that. It gave me that feeling, too, right away. I mean, hearing that it was on coast to coast, reading up on it and hearing it pop up on the Internet and then it getting enough traction to where it appeared maybe discussed. Again, I don't know if somebody was interviewed or it it was just discussed, but hitting coast to coast, I mean, I don't know. I thought of that person calling in uh, that that Art Bell call about that guy calling and freaking out about the UFOs and what the government's doing, and then getting disconnected. I wonder if it played out something like that, or but it it just had uh, that that uh, creepy pasta feel, like that New Cellus Rat House that we covered a while ago. I mean, like, right? Digging and digging, yep. I couldn't find anything to second source it. Like I said on before we did it, but it was just a cool story. But it had that feel to me. It seems like an internet story. But apparently, that's not the case. I came across uh, a couple articles that mentioned something called Tales from the Grid Square. In all these articles, it has links to their stuff. And I don't know if they did have a website, uh, but when these articles were written, but now it, it just takes you to their Instagram page. And uh, so I, I guess I, they, on their Instagram, they ha- in their links, there's a link to their homepage and it's, it doesn't work. So I guess they just have this Instagram page. But it's uh, ran by a, a dude named, quote, Nick. And we use quotes because it says Nick is an active duty soldier. And he has an interest in all things, quote, strange, unexplained, and paranormal. And he's made this place kind of to be a safe place for soldiers to report all paranormal experiences uh, that they've they had while serving in the military. And a place for them to report this anonymously to avoid any ridicule and... uh I, before, when you hear that ridicule thing, uh, when we were younger, I, I wouldn't be afraid to tell my story. Then we talked to a couple of people that have experiences. In most recent memory, the UAP report, you know, them starting off that hearing with a joke. You, you, I mean, even they had to mention the ridicule it has to be addressed when it comes to reporting UFO stuff. So 
yeah. a, again, we're seeing that that's an issue. And somebody who's a soldier wanted to make a place that's safe enough to report this to not get made fun of or anything like that. But he has collected a, a, a large amount of reports of all sorts of paranormal activity uh, reported by soldiers who served in Afghanistan and uh, a lot on giants. So I've collected uh, some quotes from this article that are from this Tales from the Grid Squares collecting of, of tales. And the, the first one is called Giants on the Feed. And of course, I took the opportunity to make some dumb music and and use spooky voice stuff. So let's take a listen to this first quote here. Giants on the Feed. I was a sensor operator on the Reaper, heading up to work a task in the northern parts of the country, scanning around, doing my thing, and looking at stuff. There are small villages high up in the central mountains that I've scanned probably a dozen times. Found a super small mud hut, which is where I saw the giants. They were three-ish, maybe four maybe meters, four tall. meters tall. tall. There's a ruler tool that tells you how wide your crosshair is, and the people were as tall as the crosshair was wide. wide. The few mud huts were extremely rudimentary, just like a mound with some holes for a door and windows. They didn't do anything crazy, just normal people things, tending fires and other chores. I wish I could say that they did something exciting, but really just mobbed around their small clearing. There were a few goats tied up, and a fire that one person was tending. Hard to tell details, but they seemed to wear rugged clothing. I would guess similar to Afghanistan traditional from how they moved, but they seemed heavily cloaked. The only interesting thing was their size. The goats looked like cats next to them. This was all in mid-wave IR at night, so they showed up as black, humanoid heat signatures. I wish I could have used our daytime camera. I always wonder if they had red hair. <laughs> I only monitored them for like 10 minutes before we were too far away to see. Anonymous Air Force Reaper Operator. I like this. This sounds like an authentic telling of uh, something somebody saw. It doesn't have a creepy pasta feel to it at all. Yeah, it's just like a quick one-off sighting, not not too much... Uh story really even it's just it's more uh, like that doesn't sound like there's any embellishment really it's just like hey i saw this guy who was really tall and lanky and that was that but impossibly tall, oh though. yeah like this isn't just like like hey i i saw a seven foot tall guy the other day like where in real life like most people if you saw a seven foot tall guy you're gonna be like holy shit that guy is huge you know, you're going to, most people are going to feel small, but seven feet is nothing when you think about how big a 12 foot tall humanoid person would be. You know, you would be like belly button level if it even had a belly button. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe they're hatched in eggs. I don't, I don't know how giants reproduce. I don't, I, I don't know. I like how he actually has some sort of instrument instrumentation to measure. He's not just eyeballing. Yeah, it that here. is that is very handy. And these are unlike us common folk, as Joe Nichols so kindly points out. Uh, this, these are trained people who are you know, regularly measuring things through binoculars, through their eyes, at a distance. So I kind of trust what this person would say more than a normal person. And then on top of them having some instrumentation, that's very interesting. What do you think about a lot of these cases? Mention. Uh, the the clothes that these giants are wearing. Uh, well, the the giant of of Kandahar was uh, said to have been dressed in animal skins, like just torn animal skins, and then even on its feet they said it had torn animal skins. Whoa! He yeah. Made himself some booties. I don't I don't know out of what animals, but some animal. Now. That's interesting because when we hear about the red-haired giants, even like uh, the red-haired wild man that's found in 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 Asia, they they're they're the wild men. They're always cavemanish. They're always yeah wild. Hence hence the name, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Yeah, yeah. They did a good. They nailed it. But with these, they're wearing clothes. Mm -hmm. They're wearing, they're, they're doing things in some of these reports that uh, are normal things that people do. What do you think? Of, like this, this is less 
of a sighting of some wild man. This is like seeing a a, a hidden culture, a, di- a hidden race. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe there's two branches. Maybe one is is sophisticated and they wear clothes and they and they look down on the savage ones and they're like, oh, those those red haired six fingered bastards. They're they're little <laughs> more than animals. Meanwhile, they're like sipping tea and you know fighting heroin demons. Yeah, keeping them at yeah. bay with the each. That's what you do. Well, you got a quote to read from there of another case. Yes, yeah. let's let's do the the spooky music thing with this one too. Spooky music. Yeah, yeah. This one is called the Giant of Kunar. I was deployed as an infantry team leader with the army in Kunar province of Afghanistan from 2008 to 2009. One night, we set in on an observation patrol to overlook the village that we suspected IEDs were coming out of due to a successful IED recovery a few weeks prior. My lieutenant gave me a new thermal imaging system called the Recon 3 that none of us were familiar with and told me to figure out what I can and pass along that information to the other team leaders. Started messing with the Recon 3 to see its capabilities and was surprised at the clarity of the zoom on it. Spent most of my time messing with the different functionalities and watching the village. Started to look across the valley to what I could see and that led me to look along the spur we were set on and saw a very large heat signature at the top of one of the false peaks. I did everything I could to get as clear of an image as I could, suspecting that it was a group of Taliban huddled together around a light, as they tend to do in the mountains. All of the sudden, the heat signature stood up as one being. The trees in that area grew up to about 10 to 12 feet tall, and this thing was at least as tall, if not taller, than the trees that surrounded it. It started taking steps parallel to my position and was covering ground quickly with ease. Its stride was slow and relaxed, yet it moved with incredible speed. That led me to believe that this creature was gigantic. It very quickly traversed the landscape and I lost sight of it along a neighboring spur. I did not believe what I saw initially, assuming I had imagined it. I never had seen anything like that in my life. I didn't tell many people about it while I was in and even when I got out, I kept it to myself, thinking there was no way I saw what I saw. But then, in 2010, I listened to a story on Coast to Coast, specifically the story about the giant of Kandahar that made all memories of my time in service come flooding back. It made me consider other things I saw during deployment. For instance, the creature was described as having fire orange hair, and it reminded me of a tradition the locals in the area of my sighting would do. They would dye their hair a bright orange color, and even would dye their goats the same color. They never gave any explanation why. It seemed like it was every once in a while they would do this, and then all of a sudden those orange dyed goats would be gone, and the locals' hair would also no longer be dyed orange. I assumed maybe it was a cultural thing that I didn't understand, but now it makes me wonder if that was some kind of gesture to the creature or Nephilim, or if the goats were sacrificed to it. I'm a Christian, and the Bible briefly discussed the men of renown, a.k.a. the Nephilim. I think that's what I saw, a member of an ancient race of giants that descended from fallen angels. Or it could be something like Sasquatch, I'm not sure. Anonymous U.S. Soldier. That one's scary, dude. (laughs) I gotta say, even being at a distance, a great distance like that, and seeing something like that, knowing that you're safe from whatever you're observing, it's nighttime, you have infrared, they don't. That had to be so fucking scary, like a horror movie moment when that thing stood up. Yeah, absolutely. You're looking at it, and you just think it's dudes huddled around a fire, and all of a sudden it just this pile of dudes just stands up, and you're like, "Oh fuck, that's not that's not a dudes huddled together. That's a gargantuan beast." Yeah, I don't think my reaction would be any different if I was 
up on that thing, I think I would have been just like, what the flying fuck? Like, that's a freeze in place type moment. Yeah. And then, and what do you say? You know, who, when, when you report that, I, yeah. I, I just saw something taller than the fucking trees. Ooh, okay. <laughs> You're fucking crazy. Yeah. I wonder if that's what his superior would have said or if he would just would have looked him in the face and said, thank you, private. <laughs> And just walked away. Yeah, who knows? What do you think about the dying of the hare, and even them dying the animals? The mention of that, I found. Yeah, that that's pretty interesting. I I had not heard of anything like that before. I had I've seen pictures of it. So when when I read that, I, I he mentioned that I was like, oh fuck, I've seen that. I've actually seen that. Even the dying of the goats, I've I've seen pictures of that. Yeah, I have no idea what to make of that. Maybe they're emulating somebody or a species. Maybe, or, or like trying to placate them or something. Mm-hmm. Absolutely terrifying. Even even being armed and at a great distance, <laughs> that would have made me turn on my holy shit light for sure. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, I got a second quote with some creepy music. Giant of Uruzgan. I was a lieutenant in the Australian Army at the time and deployed to Uruzgan province. I was on piquet, what you Yanks would call security or sentry, in my LAV in the early hours one morning, and was scanning across the valley with a thermal imager looking for threats, and saw a large human-like creature that looked different from normal because it didn't have the usual clothes the Afghans would wear. It looked like a person, but langier. 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 Not much detail through the TI and due to distance. It walked behind a few compounds and I could see it from the chest, armpits up. I lazed the compound walls to confirm distance a few times because I knew I'd get a good return off the walls. I thought it was around five, six hundred meters away, but when I did a more detailed scan, I realized it was further away. So I used the LFR to get the range and was shocked to see it was 1800 meters away. It wasn't in any hurry and I followed it for about five minutes before it went out of my FOV. Wasn't in a hurry at all, but was aware of what was happening around it. Kept looking around, especially near the compounds. No idea what it was, but it would have been at least 12 feet tall. tall. I don't know of anyone else who saw anything like it. Never told anyone about it before, but it has stayed with me over all these years. Anonymous former member of the Australian Army. That's weird, because it just, it seems like they're just, like, hanging out, doing normal things, not being monstrous, and they're just chilling. Right. This one very much supports some type of uh, other race existing there. Yeah. Like, they're even herding goats mm-hmm. and building fires and shit. Like, that's that's pretty interesting. Yeah. And again, they, they mention their clothes being similar, not exact. But something that uh, looks like it belongs from the area. It, you, again, another instrument to measure distance. And then in this case, uh, he said he only monitored but 10 minutes of observation of a, a, a small family of giants. Yeah, it's crazy. Very much so. I mean, man, the, <laughs> the, the, the quote of the goats looking the size right. of cats to them. I mean... Jeez, it's it's not it's you can say it's hard to imagine, but not really. And if you think of that, yeah, and especially because you've got things for scale, like you've got trees and goats. You know how big the trees are, and you know how and what the size of an average goat is. So, you know, unless this was an unusually small uh, goat herd that you know like maybe it was a, a herd of pygmy goats it's a dwarf and they goats. and it wasn't trees it was shrubbery yeah. so they were looking at it like oh my god look at these giant people looming over the trees of these goats and meanwhile it's just pygmy goats and shrubs is that a possibility maybe i don't know yeah. are they are, I, w- I would like to think that that someone who's scouting would would know would be able to tell the difference between trees and shrubs and be able to to gauge the size of uh, a humanoid target a little better. 
Have you ever used like infrared goggles or binoculars or anything like that? No. Me neither. No. I wonder how difficult it is to discern that stuff. Like it requires training. I mean, we see the videos and shit all the time of stuff filmed in infrared and even military videos where they have all the night vision and stuff. Yeah. And admittedly over the years, it's just gotten better and better and better and more clear. But yeah, like I said, these are, these are scouts. These are folks who are trained to watch and know how far something is away for sure. <laughs> Because it could be life threatening. All right, Mike, you got one more quote. Yeah, this this one's this one's a a quick one. Just a a quick sighting from an anonymous U.S. Air Force airman. I was an FMV analyst from 2012 to 2018. We were doing pre-op soak any of Korangal getting patterns of life on damn near every warm body. We saw some dudes around a fire, which is completely normal, but watched to see if we could ID any weapons. After about 20 minutes, what we thought were two dudes huddled together under a blanket stood up. I mean, this guy made the rest of the dudes look like children in terms of height. He stood up and walked over to a mud hut that he had to bend way over to get in. We were in infrared, so I couldn't say if he was red-haired or not, but I know that he was a big motherfucker, at least eight to nine feet. So again, we got another sighting where where it's like they've got some sort of civilization, but it seems weird that um, they they would have a hut that they would have to duck down to get inside of it. That doesn't seem very functional. Yeah, there's the other but, story where they mentioned they saw a small mud hut, and, and then they talked about seeing this fucking 13-foot-tall person, and I thought that was weird. Why would there be a small hut? But this quote says these one of these giants actually got in the small hut. Yeah, and it was just like your other story where they thought it was someone huddled around a fire, or a group of people huddled around a fire, and then it stood up. Yeah. So creepy. And th- this one mentions one of these giants kicking it with normal sized people, too. That's bizarre. Yeah. Just chilling. Hmm. So, after hearing the initial first story that went around the internet for a while and went on coast to coast, after hearing all these, what do you think about giants existing over there? I mean, when we talk about uh, the giants that the giant bones that are found there's there's quite a few that are found on in that part of the world yeah i i mean these stories could be true um but it could also be you know one of those mockingbird type situations where people heard it on coast to coast and make up their own stories very true i i just all the ones that we read tonight they all had like nice similarities believable similarities Right, but if they if it was based on something they heard on the internet, right, they, they would. They just seem like uh, I don't know. They don't have so much of a creepy pasta feel to me. It seems like uh, the similarities are natural. It seems like these are all stories being told by people who are in the same place who saw the same thing. I don't know. I I think it lends a little bit more credibility to the idea of giants being in existence. You know, it's. I find these quotes a little bit more uh, believable than the the first one that was on coast to coast, the spear attack. I mean, do you? I mean, do you think our our government would just? Uh, I mean, I don't know. We're not going to know if there's some weird mobilization, mobilization or special task force that was built to deal with it. But don't you think that would be a, like a major concern <laughs> of the governments? I mean, thirty seconds of gunfire from a whole platoon, a rescue platoon. Yeah, that's that's a lot of our. That's a lot of. Uh... A lot of bullets going into somebody, you know. That's a major that's, enemy. Yeah. And this just the ones what we're the quotes that we we read tonight, the stories that that were in this article. I mean, that's there's more than one. I mean, that's uh, you'd have to know about that. There'd have to be. I don't. I don't know. I wonder if anybody's done a Freedom of Information Act on records about giants <laughs> from Afghanistan. That's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. Get on that, somebody. <laughs> We want the secret giant files. This summer on the History Channel, <laughs> two assholes from the internet search the globe. For ancient giants. Actually, not the whole globe, just Afghanistan. And Wisconsin. And Wisconsin. And maybe the Grand Canyon. Probably the Snake Mound in Ohio. And also probably Peru and Brazil. <laughs> and maybe Russia. New Mexico. <laughs>
and and old Mexico. <laughs> yes, we will be traveling the world. <laughs> Ancient giants. <laughs> Just send emails to the History Channel. Make it happen. Yeah, tell tell them you want us specifically to host ancient giants and then the history channel can fund our travels across the world doing stupid shit and and uh i mean hunting for giants not not stupid shit completely worthwhile shit just don't let mike near the the heroin fields i will fight that monster <laughs> with its own poison <laughs> yeah I I'm going to my goal is to overdose that monster. I will put you in a permanent coma, heroin demon. <laughs> Mike's going to perk his head up like a deer when we're in a field. I'm going to go, "What's the matter?" And you're just going to run in the middle of the field, rip off your shirt, pull up this like leather rolled up kit, pull out a needle, just start shooting up. I'm I'm going to be I'm going to be like that dude in uh in desperado with with all the throwing knives but it's just loaded syringes to fight the fucking heroin <laughs> demons i just start winging these syringes at him <laughs> foolish mortal <laughs> we've developed a tolerance over the centuries and then i gotta fucking take a massive bong rip and blow weed smoke in your <laughs> face I'm like oh my god what is this it's the devil's letters <laughs> ah. Yeah, that's what I say to you. Fuck you, heroin demon. Just get high and be happy, man. Don't need to be a dick all the time. I'm starving now. (laughs) I've got the bunchies. Does anybody have a kitty? (laughs) Fuck you, heroin demon. You suck. Well, you found some other ghostly stuff. Oh, man. Yeah, some so so many ghosty, spooky things, but just real quick because it kind of fits in here. Um, I just wanted to relay a story that I was told personally from. I've, I've got a friend who was in Afghanistan in I think two thousand three, but he uh, he I think he did two tours in Afghanistan actually. But on his first time over there, he um, they were doing a night recon mission and he said they were monitoring this light that was in the distance and he ended up going to the uh infrared on on his uh i don't know the fucking but bina- i don't know what they're called the binoculars that you can go night vision or heat vision or whatever um but he had it in heat vision and he saw this thing and he said it looked like um, uh, like an oval shape and it was just like floating there. And he said, as they were watching it, these two fighter jets came in, launched a missile at it and took it out of the sky. And they, because they were on a recon mission, they actually had a recording of, of the encounter. And he, he never knew what it was. He knew it wasn't, anything the enemy had uh but it whatever it was he said it it was the the missiles were able to shoot it down yeah so i I don't know i i just thought that was kind of a cool story that that he related to me from his own experience over there wow that's uh that's pretty cool he actually knew somebody who had one of these experiences over there yeah 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 i mean it's nothing like creepy or, or anything like that but it's you know it's just kind of a weird thing that that happened i thought it was it was cool but there's there's a ton of reports um of like ghost encounters that that have been reported um by a, a lot of different people um some some of the people some of the s- soldiers or marines wanted to remain anonymous um other ones actually provided their name and a lot of these stories um for anyone who's ever like done any research on uh paranormal stories during wartime uh or during afghanistan war specifically you're going to see a lot of stuff repeated all across the internet like the giant stuff we talked about earlier and a lot of these stories that i'm going to tell have also been repeated i've i've heard narrators on youtube um 
tell their own versions of these stories. I've seen these stories reprinted across several web- websites, but they're all they're all linked back to a uh, or I shouldn't say they all are, but most of them are linked back to an article that was written by Brent Swanser. Um, so if you want to see the, the original, just look up Brent Swanser afghanistan war or something like that i don't know why is that name so familiar um he he writes for uh different paranormal websites i'm not sure if he's an author or not i I remember now i reckon okay yeah so um a lot of these stories came from research he did or i i guess interviews that he conducted with i'm not sure if he personally conducted them or if he just compiled them i'm not i don't know really the the details behind it but a lot of these stories come from this article and again they were they've been told all across the internet so it's it's again a lot of these stories tend to take on the qualities of creepypasta where just something that gets repeated over and over again and it just you know everywhere you go and you see these same stories popping up again and again just told in slightly different ways but there's, I mean, things that have been reported have, ra- they they range from just the, like, the, the well, that's weird, to I'd rather get eaten by a shark right now than deal with, with this type of situation. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, we'll, we'll start, we'll start small and, and work our way up. <laughs> so, the first one comes from an anonymous Marine who, at the time this happened, he was sitting in a, a small room with some of his superiors and a few other colleagues in this, uh, what was described as a makeshift office in the desert that had three rooms. And in this room with him, there were four other people. And as they were sitting there, his lieutenant walked through the door and entered a small room that was connected to the room they were in. And this room was considered the contractor's office. So um, the re- the Marine said that, that this wasn't like something that he had imagined or anything. He saw him clear as day. He said he had a distinctive mustache, saw the mustache. He was even wearing his frog suit, which for anyone who doesn't know a frog suit, it's like what they wear what Marines wear under their body armor. I guess it's uh, flame retardant and can take heat up to like 200 something degrees. Uh, I I don't really know too much about military equipment, but um, I just wanted to kind of put that out there in case, you know, it, cause it, he described it specifically. Um, but after this happened, the, the Lieutenant walks through the room, goes into the contractor's office, closes the door. 30 seconds later, a call comes in, they answer it, and the person on the other line is looking for the lieutenant. So this witness goes into the contractor's office to get him. He opens the door, and the room is empty. There's no other door out of these, this office. He would have to go back through the room he just entered in order to leave. But the witness didn't see anybody leave, and none of the other people in the room saw anybody leave. So he ended up going outside, checked the other exits, or well, there was only one other exit, but checked that just to make sure maybe maybe he did some like, you know, as unlikely as it sounds, like he's thinking maybe he was like crawling out of the room. And I, I, he didn't know. He was just checking everywhere. Walks around, didn't see any signs of anyone at all. It was like he just disappeared. So the uh, he goes back in, gets on the phone, and he tells him to disregard it. Just I thought, I guess I was seeing things. And then his his one of his friends who was in the room with him says, "That's bullshit. We both saw somebody walk into that room, and uh, they confirmed they they both saw it, and nobody left. But there's nobody in the room." It's, that same place, um, the 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 same witness actually had another experience a few days later, uh, this time around 10 p.m. at night. And he said he was working alone in the office, and he was on his way out. He was closing up, 
And uh, as he was getting ready to leave, the door to the contractor's office opened up by itself and it stayed open. So he went in, turned his flashlight on. He's looking all around in there. Nobody is there. But he said the whole time that he was there, he had this unsettling feeling like he was being watched. There were other times in this location as well that he uh, he would have uh, this this specific witness also claimed that at, on one occasion he was using infrared equipment and he witnessed this heat signature that was walking around the desert at night. But when he turned the heat vision off and tried to observe it with night vision camera and his naked eye, there was nothing there. God, that's got to be a creepy one. That's something you'd like, I would be nervous to to observe. Every time I put on night vision, I'd be like, I don't want to see a fucking no. phantom body. No, not at all. Um, all right, so I've got another another one, another report from a different anonymous witness. Um, this is from a different area, but they were they had encountered some phantom figures in the desert, and his story goes that his unit, in particular, would often encounter this strange figure that would appear on the outskirts of their camp, and it would vanish in an instant, just gone. Um, the first time they saw it was a little bit after dusk and a couple yards from their position. And one of the privates had told the others in the group that there was a person out in the wilderness just standing there. And the group looked, and at first they didn't see anything, but after watching for a bit, they could make out this dark blob that they said was, it, it appeared to be in the vague shape of a person. Uh, so they called the sergeant over, and he also observed the figure with them. And uh, so he asked the private who had initially reported it where the figure came from. And the private explained to him that it just popped up. He was standing there, and it just appeared. And whatever was out there, it just seemed to be motionless standing and they, they looked through their equipment and they were able to see that it was a, a person who was standing with their back to them. The witness said that they watched this person stand there for three hours and it just stood there completely motionless with its back to them. What? And they, they observed it through their optics and they were able to see that it was a person that was an adult male that seemed to be average height and build. And when they went to turn on the the um, thermal imaging, he didn't show up at all. He had zero heat signature. And they were observing him through just regular. Yeah, through through the optics on their rifles or <sighs> binoculars. That's crazy. But then they turned on the heat signature, and there was nothing. He had nothing. And then as they were watching him, he just completely disappeared. Man, but that wasn't the only time that this sort of thing had happened to this group. Six months later, this same unit was out on patrol when two members reported seeing two figures standing on top of a berm a couple hundred yards away from where they were positioned. The group anticipated an enemy IED and they stopped their vehicle and started to watch these figures that were just standing there on this elevated piece of land. And as they were watching them, they, they started, they determined that these were again, adult male seemingly that were just standing there with their backs facing the soldiers. They were completely motionless. They would not respond when the, when they were being yelled at, um, it just acting in the same way that this thing had acted six months earlier. So uh, the lieutenant ended up calling it in and a couple of the men went to go investigate. So the lieutenant calls over their interpreter to ask if he knows what's going on and if he has any idea, like if these are locals, if you know what the deal is, and the interpreter has no idea. So uh, the lieutenant makes the choice that 
they're going to go check it out. So the witness who who reported all this stuff, he stayed behind. But the lieutenant goes back with, with a couple of guys. And 20 minutes later, they come back. And he said his lieutenant had a weird look on his face. And he says, we're out of here. And that was basically it. And then they, they took off. So later, he goes up and asks one of the guys who's with the, the lieutenant what the fuck had just happened. And he's told that they got within 50 yards of these people who had their backs to them. And once they got within 50 yards, they just disappeared. Hmm. And he said it was, it was, they were literally there, and then they weren't gone. Just like that. Well, and again, we got to... We got to go with the idea here that these are people who are trained to be on the lookout for other people. I mean, unfortunately, they're hunting other people. I mean, it's, I don't, could this be uh, Ben McDewey, Dark Watchers, optical illusion here? I mean, not if they're showing up on some infrared cameras and some aren't. The second encounter happened during the day. So they, they weren't using like night vision or infrared or anything. Um, they were just observing them. But still creepy as shit. But damn, I got one that's even, even creepier. <laughs> this one I don't know what the fuck to make of, but it's so fucking creepy. So this this was a special forces unit that had encountered this thing, and they were in the mountains of Afghanistan. Uh, and they they were on a mission to set up a location to hide and and kind of spy on a village that was several miles away. Um, this particular village was believed to be harboring a certain Taliban member who was a person of interest. And the main goal of this mission was to observe the village for a few days, report any, any suspicious activity or any suspicious people, collect any useful information that could be used in a future raid, and report it back. That was basically it. So they set up a team of six men at the base, and then there were two others that were part of this unit that would sneak in closer to observe the village from a different vantage point. On the second day that they were located in this position, they started to have trouble uh, maintaining radio con contact to their uh, tactical operations center. And the transmissions would come in staticky, and they would cut in and out. And sometimes the transmissions wouldn't go through at all, and they, they had no contact. So at first it was thought maybe that the rocks in the area had some sort of mag magnetic properties that were maybe throwing it off. So they ended up, what they tried to do was reposition the SATCOM to get a better signal. And by dusk, they were still working on it. Uh, when one of the soldiers said he spotted a man that was wearing a white robe and he looked to be floating or gliding and appeared to be running through rocks that were outside of the village. <laughs> and uh, the witness said that there was something weird about the way that he described it, but they were more worried about being found out than you know, potential weirdness. So uh, when they heard that there was somebody out there, they packed up all their shit and they got ready to, to move out so that they weren't, they weren't caught so that they didn't, you know, their area wasn't given away. Um, he, he specifically said he didn't want to end up in some sort of lone survivor type clusterfuck. That, that's the quote he used, <laughs> but he said, we, we got out of there. Um, so as they're moving back, it's it's late evening time. So he said it's it's late dusk is what he said. And they were moving pretty quick so they could get back before nightfall and everyone was on high alert because they'd seen this person. They didn't know if they were spotted, what the deal with this person was. So they head back and were kind of freaking out because they had no reliable form of communication. Um, so as they're retreating back to the outpost, they set up a rear guard who's who's the witness that ended up reporting this. And he was walking backwards, making sure that they weren't being followed, but also making sure that they weren't leaving uh, an obvious trail to, to go back to their camp. 
Um, and during the ter- during the trek back, the rear guard spotted something white moving in the distance, but he couldn't be sure what it was or if it was following them. Um, but he later reported that he spotted the white figure again. And once he spotted this figure, he said he started to smell freshly baked bread. <laughs> yeah, and he, he said it, once this, this smell hit him, he had the sudden feeling of complete peace and relaxation. And he said that this feeling seemed to be emanating from the direction that they had just been, which is the very same direction he just saw this white clad figure. And he said the feeling that overcame him was so strong that he actually slowed down and he briefly considered running back the way they came toward where the white figure was. But he ended up clearing his head and let the the rest of his group know that that he thought they were being followed. So he, he, according to him, he told them all to keep their eyes open for anything because he thought he had seen someone trailing them. But then one of the other scouts in the group said, said that it was weird that he said that because he thought he saw somebody wearing white on the ridge in front of them. And he said at that point, all the hairs on on his neck stood up and everything started to feel strange. He said the air felt heavy and it kind of had this sort of sweet taste to it. And everything went silent. Like he said, it was just, there were no, no sounds of insects, no wind, nothing, just complete and utter silence. He said the sun was setting quickly, so they all started picking up their pace, moving, and uh, they put their night vision goggles on. And as the sky got darker, he said the silence seemed to spread. But suddenly, without any warning, the silence was broken by a loud noise. And I've got a quote from the witness who was talking about what happened here. He said, hallucinations happen. But what happened was beyond comprehension. First, we heard a sound like a huge airplane taking off, a low buzz that slowly increased in pitch. We had to yell over comms to hear each other. Everywhere I looked, I kept seeing what looked like glowing eyes staring back at me. But once I would center my focus on where I saw them, they would disappear. We were fucking panicked. Everyone was holding their rifles at the high ready, We were expecting some kind of ambush attack. We started talking out the RP we would meet at if we needed to start a peel and move. Then it all just stopped. Everything got dark. The only thing I could hear was my breath and the blood pumping in my head. We stopped, dug in the side of the mountain, and performed stop, look, listen, smell for about 10 minutes. Nothing, not even bugs. The air and the land were completely silent. So when he heard that sound of the plane taking off, he said that they were watching for for a plane uh, or any sort of aircraft, and there was nothing. It's just the sound of a plane. So the squad quickly heads back to the camp, um, obviously freaking out over whatever is out there. Um, And as they're rushing back, the rear guard witness claims that he suddenly noticed on the hillside parallel to their position, a man dressed in white robes who was moving towards their position. Like like it was first described when the, the um, private had seen it at the, at the camp initially, it appeared to be passing through any obstacles that it, that it came across. And he said that it, it seemed to melt over and around and through the rocks and he said the way it was moving was unnatural and through his night vision goggles this thing's eyes were glowing which i think typically happens in a human or any animal like if you're looking at their eyes through night vision Mm -hmm. uh, because of the pupils so i mean that that could indicate you know that it seemingly is a living thing but he said he scoped up on this this figure and when he did it looked like it was looking directly at him because he could see the eye shine so he could see the direction the eyes were pointed and he said it looked like it was looking directly at him like they were making eye contact through the scope and he said from from at this point 
it was pitch black. The sun had set, it was nighttime, and there was no way that this figure could have seen him from that distance without any sort of night vision. And suddenly this figure stopped, and this is the weirdest fucking part. He said he picked up one of his limbs and held it in the air, almost like he was waving it at him. And then he put his arm down, and he said the arm melted back into his form, like it wasn't an arm, but it was like some sort of expendable proboscis that was meant to look what? like an arm from a distance. Yeah, so like I just picture like some sort of weird thing just kind of melting its arm out of its trunk to make it give the appearance. And then it waves like being like, look, I'm friendly. I'm, I am a human too. And then he puts his arm down and just kind of melts back into yeah. it. Yeah. So creepy. God. And so after witnessing this, he turns to ask if anyone else can see him when the figure all of a sudden disappeared. At this point, in the distance, there were lights that started flickering near the town. And he assumed that these lights were the enemy closing in on the area where that loud sound had originated. He was assuming whatever that plane sound was was coming from the town and that these lights that were showing up around the town were, were enemy fighters moving in on the town. So they get back, they explain to the guys who were left behind camp what had happened and they don't really believe them they think that they're you know everyone's tired they're experiencing anxiety and panic because of the the down communications and the fact that they need to hide and that they might have been spotted so they're they're all you know pumped up on adrenaline and just all this combined may have led them to see things that weren't actually there but a day later, things got even weirder. I, well, I don't so, see how. This is one of the strangest things I've ever fucking heard. They, the, I, I got to give a quote from the witness to kind of describe what happened in, in his words. The reason we did the observation was so we could bring the intel back for a raid that was to be conducted. The raid was successful in the sense that finding a deer hit by a car is a successful deer hunt. Apparently, the team that moved into the village found the village completely abandoned. They also found several men in the area where I had seen the lights the night before. The corpses had been ripped to shreds, and based on the sheer amount of blood, the general consensus was that there were more men that were killed than just the bodies that were found. It went in the official records as a successful raid with several enemy KIAs. Unofficially, no one has any idea what killed them. All I know is that whatever it was, it chose, and it chose those men rather than us. Whoa. Yikes, dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So fucking scary. What do you make of that? I mean, that, that sounds and feels like another world. Yeah. Well... So that story kind of, it, it, it's talking about some sort of, un, well, I don't want to say unnatural, but like uh, seemingly otherworldly being. And by otherworldly, I'm not talking other planetary. I'm talking like yeah. other fucking universe. But I want to follow that up with, a, with another story because it, it could be related here. This one was actually the the soldier's name uh the soldier actually gave his name jerry aberdeen and he was stationed in mosul in 2004 and he said he was attached to uh an infantry unit that was at forward operating base patriot and a call went out on the radio that forward operating base diamondback which was an airfield was under attack and everybody from the surrounding operating bases were called in to to help out with it i guess so he was he was in a vehicle with some other infantry guys and um he had a engineer and a psyops guy with him and they got to the airfield and they saw some enemy combatants trying to climb over the wall and their gunner opened up fire on them and the rest of them took up position 
in a ditch on the other side of the road and also started opening up fire. And so he said in the ditch, there were three of them that were positioned side by side. It was him, the engineer, and the psyops guy. And he said they fired on one guy and he fell from the top of the wall and hit the ground. And they said right after he fell and hit the ground, a stream of black smoke started coming out of him. And uh, the engineer had made a comment assuming that the uh, combatant was wearing a suicide vest that had malfunctioned. But a, a few minutes later, the black smoke grew larger and it started to take on a humanoid form. And it eventually materialized into an uh, upright being made of black smoke with red glowing eyes and a weird looking mouth. And he said the thing smiled at them and it turned and sort of started to run. And as it was running, it just dissipated into thin air. Holy hell. I mean, that, that could be a gin. Yeah, I think that's exactly what that was. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I wonder if those white figures is a type of known entity there. Or maybe they're also gin. And like, so to me, and I hate to beat this drum again. But to me, the the smell of bread makes me think that it's Faye. And he got that feeling of comfort and he wanted right. to go back. And I think if he had gone back, he probably would have been, he probably never would have been seen again. Right, right. Wow. Hmm. And again, we're in a different part of the world. Who knows what, uh, what the Faye are depicted like over there, what they're supposed to be. Yeah. And, and I mean... A lot of these type of entities kind of have the same sort of thing going for them. Just different mythology behind it. But it seems to be uh, a lot of it is very similar. You know, the djinn and the fae and aliens and ghosts and Bigfoots. All different fae. Man. Probably, maybe. But then again, what's the fae? What it, you know, it's just a fucking term that's used to describe something we don't understand. So it's all, who the fuck knows, man? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I mean, there's even, like, bases that are considered to be haunted over there. Whoa. There's this one place called Observation Point Rock, which is nicknamed just The Rock. And it's a old fort that sits about 65 f feet above the desert, like on a, a raised hill or something. Um, But it... From a distance, it just has the appearance of a giant rock, but it was it's an old base, an old fort. Um, but it was captured from the Taliban in 2008, and the outpost is typically held by a small group of U.S. Marines that keep watch and, and basically guard it. Um, right after the Marines captured the rock in 2008, strange experiences started and their rumors started swirling about the place and they started hearing stories. Um, there was one story that Taliban fighters had been buried alive in the caves below the fortress, um, that there were Russian soldiers that were buried there during the failed Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, one group of Marines started digging a trench and they found a human leg bone and then further digging led to this discovery of more and more human remains, some of them being uh, skulls or entire desiccated corpses and even skeletons, just complete skeletons. Um, it was thought that these likely belonged to uh, the Russians because there was a stake found among these that had Russian writing on them. Mm. Um, but they they did also find out that a group of Russian Russian soldiers had been executed there in the 1980s. So it, it's you know likely that this was probably like a mass grave or something for them. But they were found by the Taliban in the 80s. They were using the rock as a hideout, and then the Taliban found them and executed them all. But among the remains, there were also shards of ancient pottery that had unknown origins. So that's kind of weird that they would be buried with these Russians. I wonder what that's all about. Yeah. Hmm. But on the on the base, Marines would report hearing no noises with no 
known source. Um, objects would be moved on their own, you know, poltergeist activity. Uh, there would be strange lights that would be seen moving around the base or in the desert surrounding it. They would hear disembodied cries and screams. There'd be the sounds of phantom footsteps or crunching gravel. Does all this sound familiar? They, there would be sudden onset of fear. Uh, electrical equipment would malfunction. Fresh batteries would die. It's it's all typical shit huh. with fucking fey, with aliens, with poltergeist. and Poltergeist, yeah. Even Bigfoot, like I talked about a few episodes mm-hmm. ago. You know, it's, it's all, it, so it's, it's interesting, but, um, a sergeant named Josh Brown said that the people say that the base is cursed. And he said, if you're stationed there, you'll definitely see weird ass lights up there at night. That's, that's the number one thing that's guaranteed. Yeah. Um, Lance Corporal Austin Hoyt said, <laughs> his quote's great. This place really sucks. The Afghans say it's haunted. Stick a shovel in anywhere and you'll find bones and bits of pottery. This place should be a National Geographic. In the front, there are weird-looking windows for shooting arrows. You know, they say the Russians up here were executed by the Mujahideen. So there's been strange phenomena that, that have been going on even before U.S. soldiers arrived. Um, there were British soldiers who had occupied the base and they had experienced all sorts of weird strangeness before American troops even showed up. And they kind of told their own experiences. Um, they said that there were floating lights that were seen around, um, phantoms and shadows that would move around at night in the desert. And sometimes they would have uh, images that would show up on infrared cameras that no one could see with the naked eye, and then they would just disappear. Yikes. There was one corporal, uh, Jacob Lima, who had a who had a couple encounters while he was there. Um, one night, he was on watch and he got startled by a scream that came from one of the men. Uh, so he ran to investigate and he found a corporal, uh, Corporal Zolik, who was at his guard post, like shaking with fear. And Zolik claimed that he'd been sitting there looking out into the desert when he felt breath on his ear and heard a clear voice whisper something in Russian. And he was so afraid that he begged Corporal Lima to stay with him until the shift was finished. And so he waited there with him and he said on several occasions, they heard footsteps up on the observation post above them, but there was nobody that was stationed up there. Oh, God. And at one point during the night, uh, Lima was scanning with scanning the area with thermal imaging, and he saw what looked like another soldier standing out in the in the desert with bald fists, just standing there with his hands just balled into fists. And he was he didn't make any, you know, the the guy wasn't moving, so he he was taking his time trying to figure out if this was a friendly soldier or, or an enemy combatant. And as he was watching it just literally disappeared. Ooh. And, uh, this, this resulted in Corporal Zolik requesting a transfer out of there. But other men had also reported hearing disembodied whispers that sounded like Russian. But, uh, Lima actually had another experience here. Um, he said that they had a dog that was kept there, um, that they named ugly Betty. And one night this dog was going nuts, barking at something. And, and he obviously, you know, you, you hear a dog barking in the middle of the night. You're, something is probably going on. So he's thinking it might be the enemy. He puts on his night vision and he scans the area out in the desert for any movement. And, uh, he spotted what appeared to be a human figure in the distance, but he wasn't quite sure what he was seeing, so he switched to thermal imaging. And when he switched to thermal, he tried to find the figure again, but there was nothing there. So then he switched back to regular night vision, and the figure was there again. But this time when he saw it, 
it had closed a huge distance in just a matter of seconds. Oh. So then he switches back to thermal once again, and there's no heat signature. He switched back to night vision, and there it was again, and he got closer. So he kept switching back and forth to try to get it in thermal, but it never left a heat signature. And eventually, while he was going back and forth, he com- lost sight of the figure completely. He didn't see it on his night vision either. Shortly after losing sight of it, he felt a very heavy tap on his shoulder. And when he turned around, there was nobody there. God, can you imagine seeing something like that coming towards you and then experiencing something like that? Yeah, fuck all that shit. Fuck that. God damn. Yeah. There's another base, too, that's said to be haunted. Um, This one is Forward Operation Base Salerno. And the outskirts of this base are actually an old Afghan graveyard. And the the base is overlooked by these two high watchtowers. And it's the towers that are said to be haunted by the spirit of a little girl, which has been reported as people have seen and heard her. One report is from two paratroopers from the 2nd Battalion of the 504th Parachute Infantry Reg- Regiment. Um, these were paratro- the paratroopers' last names were Painter and Jackson. And they were on night watch duty when they were all of a sudden surprised by a blood curdling, high pitched laugh that just started emanating from their radio. And they said it was so high pitched that it hurt their ears. Um, but it was also described as sounding like a little girl. And um, Painter claimed that there's no way any grown man would have been able to make a laugh like that. It, it was hmm. a little girl's high-pitched laugh. As soon as the laughing stopped, the, they got on the radio and radioed others throughout the base to see if anyone else had heard anything. No one else heard anything on the radio. The next night, the same two guys were on watch duty again in the same place, and they were still kind of freaked out by what happened the night before. Um, and then they started hearing movement and footsteps throughout the tower, um, specifically footsteps and pounding on a trap door that led to another level in the tower, even though they were the only ones that were in the tower at the time. And w- once they heard this pounding on the the door, the room they were in became extremely cold for no known reason. Hmm. After experiencing this, they received a call over the radio from the other watchtower, and the other watchtower claimed that they were picking up a small three-foot figure that was wandering around outside of the tower. And they weren't able to pick up any clear details, but it was a small humanoid figure that looked to be waving at them. And uh, Jackson said he went out to the balcony to investigate, but he saw nothing. It was just empty landscape. And Hmm. so he he checked everything with the thermal equipment. Everything was gone. But then another pair of watchmen claimed to see a young girl and a goat just wandering through the desert outside the base. And when they turned on the night vision, the girl and the goat both disappeared. And then when they went back to the naked eye, they weren't there anymore. So I don't know. I mean, to me, we, we've talked about like the stone tape theory where areas will pick up energy and, and we have things that are on repeat. Like the, a lot of the, the civil war ghost stories or the stuff. Um, in the castles in England. I can't remember the the tower specifically that's supposed to be haunted, but a, a lot of a lot of areas that see a lot of war tend to be haunted. And for some reason Afghanistan is one of those places where war seems to go through the country, but the area can never be conquered. Like the Persians tried it, Soviets tried it, we tried it and you know, you, you, basically all you do is throw resources and lives away when you you go to war with Afghanistan. So there's obviously a lot of death and a lot of pain and suffering. So it, it would 
stand to reason that this energy would be collected somewhere. And, and we've talked before about how a lot of these entities seem to be attracted to these negative emotions and almost feed off of it. So it would make sense that you'd have things showing up that would try to benefit from this negativity, from all of the suffering that goes on in the area. And uh, maybe that's what these things are. Maybe they're just like basically fucking mosquitoes for suffering. Man, those were terrifying, man. Yeah, it's creepy stuff, dude. I I mean, I I don't know really because... Again, it's it's like you, you look at it one way and it sounds like it could be ghosts, but then when you look at it with other paranormal experience, it's, there's something else going on. You know, it's tied together and it's easy enough to just compartmentalize it and say, no, these are ghost stories. But I don't necessarily think that's the case. I think it's something that we don't understand. Yeah, I think it's something a little bit further away from human knowledge than ghosts. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know, man, but kudos to that soldier for, for not giving into the smell of fresh baked bread and the feeling of relaxation. Cause that sounds fucking delightful. I, I mean, I, I would be the worst if, if I'm romping around the wilderness and I smell bread and I feel all chill and everything. And I'm like, Oh man, this is happy. Land. I'm going to fucking happy land. You guys have never seen me again. I'm sorry. Yeah, same here. If I get to catch a, a whiff of pupusas in the fucking woods, I'm I'm a goner. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's what can you do? You know, it, delightful bread in the woods. I want it. Give it to my face. And even though it, the results are are more than likely me getting eaten by some weird entity in another dimension, you know, I'll take that <laughs> risk for science. For bread. For science. And bread. Baked goods. Thank you for listening to the Whatcast. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, iTunes, and YouTube. Enjoy the podcast? Get yourself a Whatcast t-shirt or a sticker pack. Who was that dude on that one episode? Try the links in Homie's page. All this and more can be found at www.thewhatcasters.com. Thanks again for listening and have a great week.